If you ever want to know who actually holds power, take some time and study what groups of people you're allowed to say negative things about and what groups of people you're not allowed to say negative things about. Now, of course, the truth is, if we were a truly free society, we'd be able to say whatever we wanted. It wouldn't matter. The best ideas would win. But that's not the case. And we are taught in the universities, or at least mass numbers of people are being indoctrinated by the universities to adopt this postmodernist theory. Now, postmodernism is all about the oppressed versus the oppressor, right? And of course, they teach that white, right leaning Christian males are the oppressor. Now, postmodernism is really just cultural Marxism rebranded, right? Communism is, has proven to be such a failure that the people from the top that are pushing communism on society, um, they can't come out and say, oh, you should adopt communist ideology because people know from history, democide, 262 million people were killed by their own governments in the 20, by their own government in the 20th century. And most of those people were killed under communism. So you can't sell to the public an ideology that leads to mass death. So what they did is communism has been rebranded and now it's known as postmodernism, the oppressed versus the oppressor. And of course, the narrative that's pushed on us is that right-leaning conservative white males, usually who are Christian, are the oppressors, right? They oppress women, they oppress gays, they, they oppress black people, they oppress Hispanics. And um, white-leaning conservative right males are a great target group because demographically speaking, you could statistically look this up, are most likely to support individual liberty. And when you're trying to promote a, collective, a collectivist ideology, postmodernism, which is just an offshoot of communism, then anyone who's promoting individual liberty is the greatest threat. So instead what you do is you break people up into groups, you play identity politics, and you tell women that they are held down by the patriarchy, and you tell African Americans that they are held down by evil white males. And then you break people into groups, and people, ex people accept and vote for policies that promote collectivism. So people, they get mass hordes of women to support government-mandated equal pay, but they won't have a real discussion about the underlying causes behind the wage gap. They narrow it down to the least common denominator. They say, oh, there's a wage gap. This is because of the patriarchy. They don't want a real discussion about the underlying causes of the problems in our society. So we always hear this myth that right-leaning, conservative, usually Christian white males hold institutional power. And because of that, they should be the target group. And if you go by our litmus test, who are you allowed to say negative things about and who you're not? If you just turn on the TV, how often do you see people in the mainstream media talking negatively about white people, calling white people racist, calling white people bigots, calling white people xenophobic? It is commonplace to negatively talk about white people publicly. I mean, imagine if there was a TV show called Dear Black People. Imagine if there were constantly articles written about all the problems with black people. Imagine if there were articles written about, um, there was an article written by the New York Times published, Can I Allow My Children to Play with White Children? Can you imagine, conversely, if a white journalist had written an article titled, can I allow my children to play with black children? Can you just imagine the outrage? But there's no outrage when you talk negatively about white people. And that the reason for that is because right-leaning conservative white males don't actually have institutional power. Um, if you read Rules for Radicals by Saul Linsky, this is one of his rules. Always accuse your opponent of being what you actually are. Because the truth about institutional power in America is it's held by the progressive left, right? If you look at the mainstream media, um, it is completely dominated by the progressive left. This is why um, research has shown 
that 90%, 90% of all mainstream media coverage on President Trump has been negative. It's remarkable that President Trump has the support that he does based on that number alone because the mainstream media is able to control such of the narrative, but so much of the narrative. But this isn't limited to just the mainstream media. Social media companies are controlled by the progressive left. These aren't conservative, right-leaning, Christian white males, right? The mainstream media is completely controlled. I mean, I'm sorry, the social media is completely controlled by the progressive left. We saw undercover videos from Project Veritas showed very clearly that Twitter uses their algorithms to openly target Trump supporters or to target conservative Christian right-leaning white males. Now, I'm not saying these people have a perfect understanding of liberty. I, myself, am a classical liberal, but when I analyze society, I see which group of people is under the attack of actual institutional pressure versus the narrative, right? If it were up to me, the war on drugs would be ended. There would not be a war on drugs because the war on drugs... Um, violates the non-aggression principle. So if a person is smoking marijuana, they're putting a substance in their own body, they haven't violated the, they haven't committed an aggressive act against anyone else or their property. So what right does another person have to come along and tell them that they should be thrown in a prison cell? It's actually the person throwing the marijuana smoker in a prison cell that is a criminal in the truest, truest sense of the world, sense of the word, because you are initiating force. You are initiating violence against a person who has not committed any acts against any other person. This is an immoral act. It's not moral to initiate violence against someone that has not initiated violence against you. So, of course, the war on drugs is a farce, and the Trump administration has been completely wrong on this issue. In fact, Jeff Sessions should spend more time going after members of the deep state who are deleting emails, deleting text in an open coup against a democratically elected president than going after marijuana smokers. But apparently Jeff Sessions spends all of his time obsessing over 15-year-old boys smoking pot in their mother's basement. If conservatives truly understood liberty, they would be against the endless wars in the Middle East because so many people in the Middle East who haven't committed acts of violence against directly against Americans are under occupation, right? I mean, we are at war in Syria. Well, ISIS has pretty much been removed from Syria. So what are we still doing there? In fact, where is the left on this? If there's anything the left should be kicking and screaming about, why is there still American military intervention in Syria? Right? If ISIS is kicked out, are we presuming reg is the Trump administration, administration pursuing regime change? because he ran on the platform of America First. Now, overall, I feel like he's doing a good job, but with me, you get real media. You know, the mainstream media, they pick winners and losers, and they won't say anything negative. I mean, the mainstream media virtually wouldn't say anything about negative about Obama for eight straight years when his administration was really characterized by scandal after scandal. We have Fast and Furious, the IRS targeting of conservatives. Again, how's that for institutional power? which is just incredible scandals. And then, of course, probably one of the biggest scandals in American history, the Obama administration spying on their greatest political opponent, um, the incoming Trump administration, which is just a um, remarkable abuse of power. But um, anyway, so we see Twitter, um, Silicon Valley, Facebook routinely censors conservatives, um, but it lets, it lets progressives say whatever they want. In fact, there's an example today, one of, um, I believe, Breitbart's editor in London, he's a Muslim, um, used a curse, I think the F word or something like that, on Twitter, and he was suspended. And then Breitbart posted 67 examples of leftists using the same exact word on Twitter in derogatory fashion aimed at a specific person and not being suspended. But that's okay because Silicon Valley is controlled by the progressive left. They hold institutional power. So they allow progressives to say whatever they want, but they use every excuse possible to censor and limit the reach of people who push conservative ideals, people who push libertarian ideals, people who push anarchy like Stephen Molyneux. 
Anarchy has been made a dirty word, but actually the way he pushes it, the way Derek Bro is a great guy to follow, pushes it, is that they just don't want government. They believe that government is immoral because it gives a certain class of people, it makes one group of people a higher class than another because it gives them a monopoly over the use of force. So they're anarchists in the sense of the non-aggression principle, that as long as you're not initiating force against another person, then no one has the right to initiate force against you, which is something I also wholeheartedly believe in. We see that conservative right-leaning white males don't hold institutional power when it comes to Hollywood. In fact, if you're conservative in Hollywood, and multiple whistleblowers have um, spoken out about this, um, whether, it's, whether it's Tim Allen, whether it's Roseanne Barr, um, you have to keep that a secret. And that's why there are actually secret groups in Hollywood of conservative actors who meet because they won't go public about it, which is why you see, why you see almost, I mean, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but it's, you see a ridiculous disparity in the amount of Hollywood actors and actresses who are willing to come out and support Hillary Clinton, who are willing to come out and support um, Barack Obama. They won't come out and support Trump because if they do, the institutional hierarchy in Hollywood will destroy their careers, right? You won't be able to get a job as an actor or an actress if you have the wrong political views. And the, the right political views are progressive, which is post pushing postmodernism, which I would argue brands itself as something that it's not. It's actually made to be an oppressive ideology. Um, and again, conservatism to um, some degree, I also would say, is an oppressive and way too accepting of war ideology. Um, but this progressive ideology, because it's um, oppressive in its nature is actually, they'll censor libertarians, they'll censor anarchists who are the real people pushing for peace, non-aggression in modern society. We see this in academia because the universities are overwhelmingly progressive. And how does this happen? Um, one of my favorite videos I've ever made is, oh, what is it called? It's eluding me right now. I have a, if you scroll down, there's a picture of George Soros. I think it's something along the lines of um, why, pro, why universities are overwhelmingly progressive or something along. I'll post it in the reference notes. Um, I strongly suggest you watch it. But it explains why universities are so overwhelmingly progressive. Because the big foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the Soros um, Institute are funneling grants, billions and billions and billions of dollars of grants into these universities. And the grants go to specific things and they wind up getting control of the boards of all the universities um, and the boards are, control, are in control of hiring practices and it winds up with a bunch of progressive ideologues in control of the universities in America and they push postmodernism. And we see this all the time. Professor Brett Weinstein, Evergreen State College, um, he, he was intimidated into leaving campus and to the point where he couldn't return because they tried to have a day, a no white people day. Again, can you imagine if people at the university attempted to implement a no blacks on campus day? This isn't progressive. This is regressive. This is the antithesis of the message pushed by Martin Luther King Jr. We see conservatives on college campuses deplatformed all the time. Ben Shapiro, Milo Yiannopoulos, and like people, I mean, Milo, yeah, he's a little more controversial. He shouldn't be deplatformed because in America, if you understand liberty, you understand the value of free speech, that if you're shutting down someone else's free speech, in the end, it's going to be you who ends up in a gulag. Just study history. But even someone like Ben Shapiro, who's not exactly controversial, he's just a, he's a regular conservative guy. I would, again, I would even challenge his notion of understanding liberty. But he's not a hateful guy. But he's deplatformed. And people like that are deplatformed at college campuses all over the country. And not just by, um, not just by the students, who are often led by the professors at the universities, but many of them are actually um, just banned outright by the universities. So again, this myth that conservatives have institutional power is just that. It's a myth propagated by the group of people who actually hold institutional power, the progressive left in America, because they're pushing postmodernism, they're pushing big government, they're pushing oppression and collectivism, 
a failed ideology, so they had to rebrand it. And that's what's happening in America right now in terms of institutional power. And the reason I spoke about this today is because I found another example of it. Um, Anne Hubberlein, a Swedish author, was going to write a book or did write a book about rape culture in Sweden. And let's see. Um, as previous research shows that men from North Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia are overrepresented in sexual offenses in Sweden. So between 2012 and 2017, the start of the refugee crisis, there has been a mass increase in rapes in Sweden. But of course, because of the institutional power, there's groups of people you're allowed to say negative things about, and there's groups of people you're not. So this lady, Anne Hubbard, uh, don't quote me on the pronunciation of her name, is writing a book about culture and why there has been an increase of rape in Sweden. And clearly she is pointing out that through the refugee crisis, Sweden has taken in a great deal of people who come from a culture. This isn't about skin color, it's about culture, who come from a culture that believes in Sharia law. And under that culture, um, whether they are misinterpreting what the Quran is saying or not is irrelevant. Under the culture, large amounts of people believe that rape is an acceptable act, especially against non-believers. And that's why you see the increase of rape, really not just Sweden, but all over Europe. But of course, again, who holds the institutional power? Who are you allowed to say things about and who are you not allowed to say things about? The oligarchs at the top have an agenda that they want to flood the West with people from the Middle East for a variety of reasons. We have UN documents from 20 years ago stating that they want a population replacement, um, one to uphold their social security, their welfare state, because it's going to collapse on itself because it's unsustainable, right? Um, when the welfare state started, there was something like 60 people. Um, I don't know the exact number. There was a lot of people, a lot of young people per every retired person. Now there's something like three young people for every retired person. It's becoming an unsustainable program. So they want to flood the West with people from the Middle East, the third world, so that the welfare system, the welfare state and government power, which is really derives from the welfare state, um, can be maintained. They want to keep people dependent on the welfare state so that people vote for bigger and bigger government. And that's why the rich oligarchs push this from the top. Um, so they want to bring in migrants for that reason, and they want to bring in people who come from more oppressive ideologies, such as Sharia law, because they're much more likely to view government as a vessel of power, a government as a vessel of gaining resources, whereas people who come from the West, people who derive um, from Western ideals, which again, tends more to be white Christians, um, are less likely to vote for government power. They're more likely to oppose it. And that's why we see this population replacement being pushed. This is why we see, um, you see just a congressman last week came out and said that the Democrats couldn't possibly give up on DACA because that would be electoral suicide. Electoral suicide because the reason they want the borders open is not because they're humanitarian. They know that economically, if you have a welfare state, that leaving the borders open actually hurts Americans because immigrants who come over are more likely to need welfare, especially when you're allowing chain migration, and that's money taken directly from the pockets of Americans. If you want to have a real conversation of about immigration, I'm fine with that. But before we allow vast amounts of immigrants to come from the third world, you have to get rid of the welfare state. Otherwise... It is a war. It is, attack. it is an attack on the property rights of people who already live in the West, right? If you're saying that I have to raise your taxes to pay for someone that I'm bringing in, well, then it's an attack on your property rights, right? Your money is your property. You could bring them in, but you can't raise my taxes. In fact, if you want to do that, you have to completely get rid of it. So you see how this is all intertwined. It's all, it is all about institutional power. So anyway... This author tries to write this book, and now Kickstarter has deplatformed her, so she can no longer raise money on Kickstarter. And this is just another example of institutional power not being in the hands of conservatives. I'm assuming this lady 
is right leaning, being that she's writing a book about rape culture being brought in from the third world. It's typically conservatives who are against immigration and progressives who are for open borders, um, which again, I would be. It's part of my ideology, but not until you get rid of the welfare state. Otherwise, every other part of my ideology is going to be destroyed simply by offering people money through the welfare state to vote for bigger and bigger government and the destruction of individual liberty. So Kickstarter deplatforms this woman who's just trying to write a book explaining that Sharia, Sharia culture leads to crime and rape and is actually goes against what is true women's rights, right? If we're really for women's rights, we would certainly be opposed to a culture that, um, again, whether it's a misinterpretation or not, essentially gives an okay to the rape of women who don't conform, who don't put on um, the hijab and serve their husband. So all of these institutions are clearly controlled by progressives. And this completely destroys the narrative that it is conservative, right-leaning, Christian white males who hold institutional power. Because the truth is that progressives on the left hold most of the institutional power in this world. And they're interested in postmodernism. They're interest, interested in collectivism. They're interested in communism. So if you study history... Take some time and really think about it. Do you want your society to look like the Soviet Union? Or do you want your society to look like one that promotes individual liberty and the principle of non-aggression? You see here? Funding suspended. But if you try to raise money on Kickstarter to write a book about how great Sharia law is, well, that's perfectly fine.